So um, what I wanted to present is an idea of, um, of Nicholas of Cusa as, as an individual and history uh, seen through the life of, of Cusa. Um, before and during and, and after. And uh, after is a, a whole other class, but you get the, you'll get the sense of what the after is at the end. Um, we, are, we are the after, and now the question is, what are we gonna, are we gonna continue the groundwork that he laid and, and our, our forefathers laid? Um, in, in Lynn's latest paper, he um, starts in the beginning with this idea of, he said, this brings us to the issue of oligarchical method. What we actually know respecting the ancient roots of presently remembered science and culture is actually centered in an embittered conflict between principally two bodies of cultural practice, a conflict reflected in the legendary war between what are known respectively as humanism and oligarchism. The first of these, humanism, is associated with the name of Prometheus, who is, whose adversary is the Olympian Zeus. There's Zeus being worshipped properly, as Zeus would, would, would say. Um, the capricious, arbitrary god of Olympus. That what Prometheus did uh, was fashion man out of clay, and Athena then imparted reason to man. Now, further what Zeus did was he stole fire, or what Prometheus did was he stole fire from Zeus. The intention to give it and, and bring it down to man. And for this, he was chained to a rock to have his liver eaten out every day. And every night it would grow back, and the next day the same torture would begin again. And this, uh, this eagle, you know how, in the, how the Holy Spirit is often represented as a dove? Well, this is the opposite. He's finally saved by Hercules. Um, so, what Lynn then goes on to say is that the uh, appearance of the systemic conflict between Plato and the professional poisoner known as Aristotle was already an expression of the exact same conflict as that between what appeared as Christianity's struggle against the Roman Empire and as Christianity pitted against the modernist existentialism of Friedrich Nietzsche. You see in this, this uh, detail from Raphael's School of Athens, you have Plato on, the, on your left, pointing upwards to God, to the Creator, to the heavens, to that which is unseen. And you have, and he's holding the Timaeus. <clears throat> And you have Aristotle holding his book, Ethics. And he's pointing down to what you can see, what's here on earth. And, um, yeah? This is the Timaeus right here, Timaeo, that he's holding in his hands. Uh, it's, a, it's a dialogue about the one and the many. Or no, no actually, uh, that's the Prometheus. Timaeus is uh, a dialogue about um, the, yeah, the creation, and and you have this the the, the whole like geography is discussed in this, and and uh, it's so it's about the the idea of um, the creation of the universe, ontology of the universe. Now this is Tiberius, um, who is the Roman emperor at the time of the the death of Christ, the murder of Christ. And at this point, what you had was basically God worship of the Roman Emperor, that the Roman Emperor was God. And uh, it, it's funny because there's a whole, there's a whole myth around um, Rome that it was popular 
uh, that, that, that there was popular support of these emperors, but the idea was that that, that, was in, in, that was a long time ago, and basically the population had agreed to give up their, uh, their, their power to vote to the emperor. So it was basically a myth from, from the past that they had the right to vote and that, this, that the, the emperor had popular support. But you had a, a conception of the emperor as God. Now a revolutionary came along, <clears throat> Jesus Christ. And this is um, after his... Uh, after he's buried, and he arises from, from the dead, and he appears as a gardener uh, in, in Rembrandt. But this revolutionary challenged the whole conception of the gods, the capricious gods, and man in the image of God. Man and the dignity of man in the image of God the Creator and participating in God the Creator. So in a sen certain sense, I want to say this is not a question of, of theology or, uh, it, you know, do you ha should you be recruited to Christianity? If, if you're Jewish, should you feel like you should be Christian? If you're Muslim, should you feel like... No, it's not, it's, that's not really the question. It's a conception of, of man. I mean, we're, we're a, a movement of ideas. And we have Muslims, Christians, and Jews in our, in our movement around the world. And, but there's an agreement of the conception of mankind. And the, the, the fight which is waged over the question of the Trinity is, ex is exactly that idea, that idea of man uh, in the image of the Creator and the, the relationship between God and man. So we'll get, we'll get into that more. But. Now, St. Augustine, what I want to do is just give you a very brief um, history up to the point of Cusa's birth. Uh, and it'll just be a thumbnail sketch, but a very, very critical people. Um, St. Augustine, was uh, he wrote a book uh, called the, the City of God, which is a, a very important book. For one thing in here, he, he develops the idea that, that Socrates and Plato are closest to Christian belief of the, of the Greek philosophers because of the, their method of thinking, because of their method of, of, um, of, of a, of a non-sense certainty view of philosophy. Um, so Augustine is very critical, and he's critical in terms of the, the Platonic school of thought within within Christianity, because there's another school of thought, the Aristotelian school of thought, and we'll develop that more, but you already see from Raphael what the, what the fight is, right, and from what Lynn said, what the fight is between Plato and Aristotle. Around 600, you had, uh, out of Ireland, St. Columban and St. Columba, and what they did was they developed monasteries you can see all over Europe. And um, there's a, a picture of a monastery up there. And basically, they believed in uh, transforming nature to serve mankind. I mean, they were, they were farmers. Uh, they, they developed advanced agricultural methods for the time. And they also built cathedrals, uh, which were not anywhere near as great and beautiful as the cathedrals that would come later. But nonetheless, these were places where people could come and be uplifted. And, um, and, and um, they could be surrounded by, by beauty and, and uh, the beauty of a cathedral as, as, as great as could be built at the time. Then you have Charlemagne uh, and Alcuin who came out of this Irish monastery movement. Uh, basically, Charlemagne was down in Rome, uh, met Alcuin and said, come with me back to Aachen. And in, uh, in Aachen, uh, they, they developed a, a center of, um, of learning, uh, a center of, of uh, well, you see, the, here's the, the beautiful cathedral that uh, Charlemagne had built at the time. And you can, you can see it's, it's, it's quite a development from the cathedrals only 200 years prior. 
So Charlemagne traveled all over Europe. And in 800, he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor uh, by Leo III. The story is that he actually didn't want to become emperor. Uh, that, that, in fact, um, what is said by his, his biographer, Nodeker the Stammerer, that he, had no, he would not have gone into the church had he known he was going to be uh, uh, crowned emperor. But what he had was a conception of, of building, uh, the, the, of nation building, even though it wasn't a nation yet. It was a conception of nation building in the sense that there were great canals built, uh, there were trade routes developed between Europe and uh, the, and the um, East. And here you have Harun al-Rashid. What you have under Charlemagne is a, is a, sen a conception of ecumenical uh, relations between Christianity and Islam. And this is, uh, in, in actuality, Charlemagne never went, never met Harun al-Rashid. Uh, this is a this is an allegorical uh, painting. It's, it's in a sense it's, it's the dream, a dream of, of Harun al Rashid. And uh, what what uh, Charlemagne did was he used members of the Jewish community as a as an intermediary between uh, between the Holy Roman Empire as, as such and uh, the middle and um, Harun al Rashid's caliphate. But this was critical because this, this developed trade routes between this area and it also created a basis for ecumenical agreement between people of the book. Uh, whether they were Muslim, Christian, or Jew, uh, they were people of the book who believed in one, in one God. And uh, so this was, this was very important. Now, later you have um, John of Salisbury, who he develops He's a student of Peter Abelard, um, and he becomes the, uh, he's the head of the church at the Chartres Cathedral, cathedral. and you can see, I mean, it's, it's a very beautiful cathedral, very, very beautiful, and on, on, the out, on the outside of it, you have Pythagoras there, who's working on uh, geometry, I would imagine, uh, so you have a, a conception. This is an institution of, of learning. It's an institution of science and progress. Um, and on the inside, absolutely beautiful. A beautiful uplifting of anybody who would walk into this cathedral. And he writes a book uh, called the Polycraticus. And he says, between a tyrant and a prince, there is this single or chief difference that the latter obeys the law and rules the people by its dictates, accounting himself as but their servant. It is by virtue of the law that makes good his claim to the foremost and chief place in the management of the affairs of the commonwealth, and in the bearing of its burdens. And his elevation over others consists in this, that whereas private men are held responsible only for their private affairs, on the prince, falls the burdens of the whole community. So here you have a very, uh, this, is, this is around um, 1150, um, a very developed idea uh, of, of, of you know, mankind for that time. Um, now the, the the first, you have a series of nation states that come into uh, existence around, around this period of John of Salisbury. You have Henry II, King of England, from 1154 to 1189. And, and what he does is he develops a series of laws. The Assize of Clarendon is the first law in 1166. And what this does is it creates a jury system so that every, every, every person in England will be uh, judged by a jury of their peers. And uh, so, ironically, what you'll hear is in 1215, you have the Magna Carta, and this is what all, all law is based on after that. I mean, this was a great thing, where, because the king was put in his place. And the irony of it was that the Magna Carta was a direct attack on Henry II's view of law 
law, which was that everybody, all citizens, had the right to a trial by jury. And under the Magna Carta, any 25 noblemen could get together and basically overrule the king. So you had this, it's, it's more complex than, than one would think in terms of a kingdom. Uh, well, kings are bad, you know, because kings are, 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 well, bad in comparison to what? Bad in comparison to a feudal system where people are like cattle or like serfs, slaves on a feudal plantation and there's no rule of law. There's only the capricious will of whoever happens to own you in this little, this little feudal area. So in comparison to that, a king, and later Cusa develops the idea of an elected king, which is a totally different concept than what, I mean, kings don't get elected, they're ordained by God to rule over everybody else, right? Well, no, not, not according to Cusa. But that what you have with uh, Henry II is the beginnings of this idea of law that pertains to, to all. Now, Friedrich II Hohenstaufen becomes the king of Sicily, and he also is the Holy Roman Emperor from 1212 to 1250. And this is very funny because <clears throat> what happens is he is uh, challenged by Pope Gregory IX to launch a crusade against, against the Muslims. And uh, he, he definitely resists this. He resists it and resists it, and basically he's excommunicated by the Pope. Um, so what he does then is he, he finally goes over, but he goes over with a very small group of, of people, soldiers. And, uh, and then what he does is he, he meets with the, uh, the sultan and, and organizes a, 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 a truce, a treaty. So instead of going in guns blazing and you know, I'm going to kill them all, he, he organizes a, a treaty. And in exchange for the treaty, he gets access to Jerusalem and Nazareth and these holy sites that he's supposed to be over there to get anyway. But of course the Pope is furious because he was supposed to go in and kill everybody. Uh, and instead, so but at the same time, as he's there, he wants to find out what's, what's the science that's going on here? What are the advanced developments that are going on at this time? So he's totally fascinated with, uh, with getting at the, the scientific developments in this area. Um, in 1224, he, he establishes a university, uh, the oldest university in Europe, uh, the University of Naples in 1224. Uh, now, uh, Louis XI establishes in France, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah, sorry, Louis IX uh, establishes a nation state in France and very much the same idea of a, a body of laws that pertain to, uh, to everybody in the nation. Now in Spain, Alfonso X, known as the Wise, uh, who's the nephew of Friedrich II, Hohenstaufen, uh, he, he develops a conception of the um, Again, an ecumenical court where you, you have the science, just in, in southern Spain, you have Andalusia, which is a, um, an Islamic uh, area. And it's, it's, it's a center of scientific, from, from, you know, from 200 years prior to this, a center of science, a center of progress, etc. And um, so what Alfonso X does is he brings these leading scientists into his court. And he, and he works with them, and he develops um, a, a series of laws called, called Las Siete Partidas. And in, just to give you a sense of it, in this he says, the lawmaker should love God and keep him before his eyes when he makes the laws in order that they may be just and perfect. He should moreover love justice and the common benefit of all. He should be learned in order to know how to distinguish right from, right from wrong, and he should not be ashamed to change and amend his laws. He should prefer to act for their, their own advantage. Um, he says tyrants, rather, prefer to act for their own advantage, although it may result in injury to the country rather than for the common benefit of all. 
uh, he proclaimed that the only true authority to govern comes from the ruler's dedication to the common good. If the ruler should make a bad use of his power, people can denounce him as a tyrant, and his government, which was lawful, will become wrongful. The union of all men together, those of superior, middle, and inferior rank, were called the people. For all are necessary, and none can be accepted from the reason that they are obliged to assist one another in order to live properly and be protected and supported. So an idea of the, the commonwealth. Again, now Thomas Aquinas was a student uh, from the University of Naples. And we see him, this is a painting by Francesco Traini, who is from the 1400s, or the late 1300s, early 1400s. And you see him crushing uh, Averos. Now the interesting thing is, the question is, is he crushing Averos because Averos is a Muslim? No, he's crushing Averos because Averos is an Aristotelian. That Averos was spreading the Aristotelian uh, plague throughout the Islamic community. And um, that, 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 that what Aquinas represented was a conception of Platonic Christianity and, again, a defense of natural law and, uh, and the common good, the commonwealth. And he writes about this again and again. Dante Alighieri uh, comes directly out of this he writes the Divine Comedy where there's a conception again of man going through hell, going through purgatory and getting to paradise through the development of his, of his mind, the development of his capacity. Petrarch uh, was in the same period. Uh, he was the son of a personal secretary to Dante. And um, he was a, an avid anti-Aristotelian. He goes to, um, to Venice to try to spread Platonism and basically gets, gets driven out by his four famous friends, Tommaso Talenti, Guido de Bagnolo, Leonardo Dandolo, and Zaccaria Contarini. And he's come from very famous Venetian families and uh, what they say is that he's a good man but has no education. So he's driven out. So then he writes this, this, this book called On My Ignorance and That of Many Others. He says, just a couple of quotes, let them keep their exorbitant opinion of everything that regards them and the naked name Aristotle which delights many ignorant people by its four syllables. No Christian, <laughs> no Christian and particularly no faithful reader of Augustine's books will hesitate to confirm, confirm this, nor do the Greeks deny it. They call Plato divine and Aristotle demonis. So, then you have Giovanni Boccaccio from right around the same period. Now, he writes the Decameron, which is absolutely critical in terms of uplifting the population. Now, one thing just about um, Alfonso the Wise is he develops the Spanish language. Las Siete Partidas is in Spanish. You also have Ramon Lull, who writes a number of things in Spanish, who's a philosopher from that period. What Dante does is he develops the Italian language in Italy. And again, this is critical in terms of the formation of the nation state, because you have a common, what they call you know, of the Vulgate, right? the vulgar language. But it, it doesn't mean vulgar. It means the, the, common, the language common to the people. Boccaccio and Dante further develop the, the Vulgate uh, Italian. And what you have from 1347 to 52 is the beginning of this horrific plague, uh, which, which arrives on, uh, on, on some trading ships and then spreads throughout Europe. You have, uh, you know, horrific death and horrific insanity, burning Jews alive during the Black Death. They would blame, they would say, well, there's Jews here and we're, we're getting hit by the plague. The Jews must have spread it. And then others, you know, I think, I think it was Boccaccio himself, I think either Boccaccio or Petrarch, who said, well, wait a minute, there's, pl there's many places where there are Jews and there's no plague. So, but, it, you know, there was no reason. There was total, total fear, total hysteria, total insanity, flagellants walking around whipping themselves. Peter Bruegel's The Triumph of Death. So what you see here is 
this is the period of the Black Death. So considering what you had up to that point, forget about this for now. What you had up to that point, it's pretty bleak. It's uh, you know a third to half of the population totally wiped out in, in Europe in this period. Now, what we're going to look at is the effect of Kuza and his, uh, and his philosophy and the nation-state project that would lead to that tremendous rate of growth of population, because that's the scientific basis to prove that these, these ideas are true. But they actually, as, as, um, as Sky discusses in the latest weekly report, this, this idea of potential population density, that you have to develop you develop the, the scientific capability and the ideas that allow you to get the potential population density first and the population growth. Conversely, if you destroy science and progress as Obama's doing, then you get the, the direct result of, of decreased population because you're destroying the potential population density. Just another example of it. Right around here is a critical, critical shift. So this is Northern Italy, um, just some important towns, it's Venice, which is the center of the, you know, of the empire, Padua, which is trying to remove itself from the center of the empire, Colonia, uh, Florence, absolutely critical city, Ferrara, in between Padua and Florence, just to give you a sense of this. So from Venice, Padua, Ferrara, Bologna, Florence, that's a very critical line of cities that you'll hear about as we go on. Now this is a Manuel uh, Chrysoloris, who's Greek, but um, he comes to Florence and teaches um, a, a person named Traversi, Ambrogio Tra oh, Traversari, um, Greek, he teaches him Greek, he teaches him uh, Platonic, he brings Platonic uh, writings, and Traversari then becomes the, the, sort of the beginning of this Platonic uh, school in Florence. Around the same time, you have Brunelleschi, who was, was born in 1377. Um, there will be a whole other class on, on, on this gentleman uh, in the future, I, I think. Um, somebody in the audience will be giving that class. But Lynn says that between Cusa and Brunelleschi, uh, these are the two critical people that further the development of mankind in, in this period. And touch on what Brunelleschi does uh, with, his, with his beautiful architecture. Uh, now, this is the, um, this, for example, is, is built by Brunelleschi, uh, the Kamal Delusian Order. Uh, this is, uh, Tra um, Traversarini comes out of this, uh, out of this order, and this is a center of scientific progress and development um, so in 1401, Nicholas of Cusa is born, and uh, as a as a young man, there's there's disputes, but um, this is his birthplace. You can see he's born in, in, in Trier. He's up here. Uh, Right on, right on this beautiful river, and this is the house that he's born in. Uh, there is debate over whether he was directly educated by the, the Brotherhood of the Common Life in Deventer, but certainly was influenced by the ideas of the, the Brotherhood of the Common Life, uh, Gerhard Groot, Thomas Akempis, and uh, what, what the Brotherhood of the Common Life did at, in this period was basically take poor young children and educate them. Uh, and not just, not just boys, but girls as well. And it's, you know, this is where uh, Joan of Arc comes out of as well. 
that she is, uh, uh, they, they set up whole clo cloisters where they would educate young women as well. Poor young men and women, boys and women, uh, boys and girls. And the idea of creating a, a renaissance through education. So in 1417, Cusa goes to the University of Padua and he studies there from 1417 to 1423. Now this is the School of Engineering and Building. You see you have this piazza in the middle and this is now a, a coffee shop on the outside. It opens up to the inside. But this is in modern Italy, you know, modern Florence. It must be amazing to walk around Florence and see these, these buildings that are still there and that represent this incredible history. So there he meets uh, Paolo Toscanelli, who's going to become very important in, in the development of this uh, of, of science and this story to create the American Republic. Francesco Filefo, who um, studies Greek under Michael Chrysoloris as well. And he, uh, he travels to Constantinople in 1420 and grabs as many manuscripts as he possibly can and brings them back to Florence. All kinds of works of Plato, etc. Um, around the same time, Brunelleschi is given the, uh, he, he wins a uh, contest. So he's going to, the contest is going to, he's going to build the dome uh, of the Florentine cathedral, which you'll see. And uh, he also, Leon Battista Alberti, who is a famous architect, is also in Padua at the same time. So you have this center of this crystal uh, in 1417 to 1420, 21, 22, 23 of Toscanelli, Cusa, Alberti, and uh, Filelfo. Now, um, Pope Martin V convenes the Council of Basel. Um, Cusa, um, Cusa is a, Cusa goes to the Council of Basel as a representative for one of the electors uh, from Trier of, um, of the emperor. And there's a, there's a dispute over this elector. You know, did he get fairly, uh, was he fairly elected or what? So they're going, he's going as a representative to determine this. That's the, that's the story. But what he does there um, is he, he writes the Concordancia Catholica at, in the Council of Basel. And this is an absolutely incredible document. Um, the, the, so what he does, now at the same time, uh, the, the pope, the, the, the next pope, um, Eugene IV, who comes in right as this Council of Basel is formed, who becomes a, a, a critical ally of, of Cusa, um, he, has to, uh, he has to leave Rome. Basically, the oligarchical families drive him out of Rome. So he goes to Florence, and uh, he brings Alberti with him, the architect Alberti. He accompanies him to Florence. Um, Giuliano Cesarini is a cardinal who is in charge of the Council of, of Basel. Uh, he represents the Pope at the Council of Basel. Uh, later on, Cusa will dedicate a number of writings to Cesarini. Um, but in this, in this council, um, Cusa comes as the dean of the church of St. Florin and Coblenz. This is the, this is the church. And uh, what he does is he writes the um, Catholic Concordance. First of all, um, this is from Aristotle, uh, just to give you a sense of what 
the evil of the Aristotelian method and what, what Cusa answers in this. Um, Aristotle says, it is not only necessary but useful and from the hour of their birth, some are marked out for those purposes and others for the other, and there are many species of both sorts. Talking about slaves. So it is natural with the male and the female, the one superior, the other inferior, the one governs, the other is governed, and the same rule must necessarily hold good with respect to all mankind. Those men, therefore, who are as much inferior to others as the body is to the soul are to be thus disposed of, as the proper use of them is their bodies, in which their excellence consists. And if what I have said to be true, they are slaves by nature, and it is advantageous to them to be always under government. He then is by nature formed a slave who is qualified to become the chattel of another person, and on that account is so, and who has just reason enough to know that there is such a faculty without being endued with the use of it, for other animals have no perception of reason, but are entirely guided by appetite, and indeed they vary very little in their use from each other. For the advantage which we receive both from slaves and tame animals arises from their bodily strength administering to our necessities, for it is the intention of nature to make the bodies of slaves and freemen different from one each other. That the one should be robust for the necessary purposes, the others erect. Useless indeed for what slaves are employed in, but fit for civil life, which is divided into the duties of war and peace. Though these rules do not always take place, for slaves have sometimes the bodies of freemen, sometimes the souls, if then it is evident that some bodies are as much more excellent than others, as the statutes of the gods excel the human form, everyone will allow that the inferior ought to be slaves to the superior. And if this is true with respect to the body, it is still more just to determine in the same manner when we consider the soul, though it is not so easy to perceive the beauty of the soul as it is of the body. Since then some men are slaves by nature and others are freemen, it is clear that when slavery is advantageous to anyone, then it is just to make him a slave. So what's the point? What's the point? Yeah. This is... The point is, this is Aristotle's view of mankind. That's flawed. That, that's, that's oligarchy. Oh, it's totally flawed. That's the oligarchy. Absolutely. That's, that's the oligarchical view of mankind. Cusa, in Concordancia Catholica, directly takes this on. In, in book two, in book two of the, of the Concordancia Catholica, what he says is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna tell you what what Kuzu says about this, gentlemen. I'm gonna tell you what Kuzu says about this. He has a totally different view of mankind. He says, hence, since natural law is based on reason, all law is rooted by nature in the reason of man. The wiser and more outstanding men are chosen as rulers by the others to draw up just laws by the clear reason wisdom and prudence given them by nature, and to rule the others by these laws, and to decide controversies for the maintenance of peace. From this we conclude that those better endowed with reason are the natural lords and masters of the others, but not by any coercive law or judgment imposed on someone against his will. For since all are by nature free, all are by nature free, every governance whether it consists in a written law or in a living law in the person of a prince can only come from the agreement and consent of the subjects. For if men are by nature equal in power and equally free, the true, properly ordered authority of one common ruler, who is their equal in power, can only be constituted by the election and consent of the others, and law is also established by consent. So this is a very, very revolutionary idea. And imagine if you're, if you're a king, or if you're a tyrant, I should say, you're not happy with this, this view that's now being presented by Kuza. Now again, remember, Kuza is just a, he's, he's from a church. He's not a cardinal. He's not, he's, he's put on the committee of faith. And he writes this, this book, and not all of it at once, actually. He writes certain parts first, and then he adds in the more controversial towards the end, uh, like this section. Uh, now, what he, what he develops in, in, in the second book of this um, is on the question of, he, he takes on the question of the Catholic Church and the, the, the question of the power of the, um, of the Pope. 
is the Pope all powerful? Because this is really, you know, what you have is a back and forth between the Emperor and the Pope for, for a long time prior to this. And so what he says is that Peter, of course, was the, was the first Pope of the Catholic Church, right? the rock upon which the Church was, was built. Um, he says, nor was Peter greater than the Church by reason of his primacy because he was named by and for the Church. As Augustine says in the place quoted above as well as in Ambrose and other, and, and other doctors of the faith referred to above. Therefore, that supremacy of Peter was not a supremacy over, but within the church. Hence, although he was the spokesman and the head of the apostles and of the church and proposed actions in its name, as in the first chapter of the Acts, and spoke uh, for it, he was no less subject to it as a member of the church. And he quotes Matthew 23, Do not call one another rabbi, for there is one who is your master. Christ, and you are all brothers. Hence, in this respect, there is a brotherhood of the faithful in Christ. As is touched upon above, the power to rule is not rooted and established in the church by God in a coercive fashion, but for the purpose of ministerial care. So, this is, this is what he's saying to the popes. You're not, because you have this, you know, there's this famous story that, that Helga talks about, Boniface VIII, I think it is, who Dante puts in a particular rung of hell. And he comes out and he goes, Echo Caesar, Echo Imperator, right? I am Caesar, I am the Imperior, you know, I am I am above all. And Cusa says, no, you're not. And what Masaccio, Masaccio is a, a, a painter, and you can see he only lives to be 27 years old. And they, the story is that he's poisoned by a, a jealous painter, but who knows who really killed him. But you'll see, um, this is the Santa Maria del Carmina in Florence, the Branchacci Chapel, which again is just another example of a beautiful church in Florence and, and obviously totally uplifting to anybody that comes in. And he does a series of paintings on the life of Peter. So here you have Peter being, he's angry about the tax collector who's come and he's, he's, he's ready to strike him and Jesus says, no, go over and, and fish. You know, do some do some work and fish, and uh, and then then you'll have the means to pay the tax collector. And the punchline of it is that the tax collector is is a cripple. He's got his cane. He has he's uh, so it, it's he's not all powerful, right? There's something there's something more powerful. Um, Saint Peter healing the sick with his shadow. Of course, this is a very platonic idea. And what you see, again, is this man in, in three different levels, right? Man is, is, is a beast, man developing his conscience, and, and man is a citizen of, of the state, man with reason, and is a citizen of the state. And you see uh, his, his shadow healing these, these people. This is the resurrection of the sun. Um, you know, again, the conception of, of Peter's, Peter's power, but through grace, not through arbitrary, capricious will. And this proves the point. People may know that um, the way Peter was crucified, he was crucified on a cross by the Romans, um, like Jesus, but he refused to be crucified uh, in the same fashion, so he demanded that he, that he be hung upside down, that he wasn't worthy to be crucified in the same way as Christ. So that's, that's a pretty humble person, the first pope of the Catholic Church. Now, Cusa then goes on in book three, and he lays out the political foundations of the, of the nation state. He says, natural laws proceed all human considerations and provide the principle for them all. First, nature intends every kind of animal to preserve its physical existence and its life to avoid what could be harmful, and to secure what is necessary to it. For the first requirement of essence is that it exists. But from the beginning, men have been endowed with reason, which distinguishes them from animals. They know because of the existence of their reason that association and sharing are most useful. 
indeed necessary for their self-preservation and to achieve the purpose of human existence. So it's a question of a, of a community. It was clear that by a marvelous and beneficent divine law infused in all men, they knew that associating together would be most beneficial to them and that social life would be maintained by laws adopted with the common consent of all, or at least with the consent of the wise and illustrious, the wise and illustrious, and the agreement of the others. So here you have a, a real Republican conception, right? You think of the founding of the United States later, that everybody isn't in Congress, right? Diane and others may be in Congress soon, but everybody's not in Congress. They elect people who are wise, hopefully. That hasn't happened in a while, but um, that, that, and, that, and they vote and they consent to law with the agreement of the others. So again, it's a very advanced concept uh, for 1433. Therefore, by natural instinct, they have joined together and built villages and cities in which to live together. And if men had not established rules to preserve peace, the corrupt desires of many would have prevented this union from improving human life. For this reason, cities arose in which the citizens united and adopted laws with the common assent of all to preserve unity and harmony. And they established guardians of all these laws with the power necessary to provide for the public good. Servitude can be by choice. It is less worthy if by compulsion and better if freely chosen, since good is more meritorious when performed freely than out of necessity. For nature does not make man a slave, but ignorance. Nor does manumission make one free, but learning. For those who live by the law are free, but true law is righteousness. True law is not carved on tablets nor cut in bronze, but stamped on the mind and imprinted on the senses. So again, you have this conception of natural law, and this is what Leibniz later echoes this idea that you're not a tabula rasa, you're not an empty slate, but that you have true law is already imprinted uh, on, on your mind. Um, <clears throat> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just skip these and, and go on because it's more of a discussion of the same. Now, this is just one thing. Um, Gregory V gave his consent to have this agreement. I'm sorry. What he develops here <clears throat> is a, a conception of uh, division of, the, of, of temporal law and the church. So he weighs in on this. Uh, this is particularly true of the elect election of a king or emperor whose existence and power do not depend on any one man. Thus, the electors derive their basic authority fundamentally from the common consent of all those who could, by natural law, have created the emperor, and not the Roman pontiff, who has no authority to give any region in the world a king or emperor without its consent. So that's a very important development as well. Right? He's saying to the pope, you don't have the power to give any region a king or emperor. That is, is up to their consent. Um, Gregory V gave his consent to this arrangement, but only by virtue of his position as pontiff of Rome, who has the right to participate in accordance with his rank in expressing his consent to the common emperor. So also in universal councils, the pontiff as the one in the first rank rightly participates in consenting, along with all the others attending the same council. The force of the decree depends, however, not on his consent as chief pontiff of all, but on the common consent of all. He says, it's the priesthood is like the sun and the empire of the moon. So this is a very, very uh, interesting idea. It's very revolutionary for its period. I mean, it may not seem that way now, but just imagine if you were alive in that time. It's very, very revolutionary. <clears throat> now, there is a direct intervention. I mean, this is not... Um, this is not theory. This is not nice ideas that are in books. And I mean, this, this, there's a direct intervention. You have in 1435, the Congress of Arras. Uh, the collaborators of Nicholas of Cusa, centered in the city-state Republic of Florence, intervene in France, in, in, in the French conflict between France and England, the so-called Hundred Years' War which had, had five years prior taken the life of, of Joan of Arc. And she'd been burned at the stake five years prior. And she had been leading, basically attempting to establish the French nation 
uh, against against the British, and she's the, the British organize her her assassination, and uh, Charles the Seventh despicably goes along with this at the time. <clears throat> so Cusa in Florence organizes as part of the organization of the Congress of Arras, um, and the the people that, that are involved in this, um, the are. Um, There's a delegation that goes to Aras. It's, uh, this, this humanist, uh, Cardinal Albergati, and two secretaries of his, Tommaso Parentuccelli, who's a close friend and a librarian to Cosimo de' Medici, who will later pay for the, the moving of the, Council of, Flor of, of the Council down to Florence, and who was a, I mean, a key banker. It was the, the key banker in Florence for all kinds of cathedrals and great projects. Um, now this, this uh, Parentuccelli would later become Pope Nicholas V, who's a key ally of, of Cusa, and, um, and Aeneas Piccolomini is the other uh, uh, secretary to Albergati, and he will become Pope Pius II, who's another key ally of Cusa later. Um, so basically what they do is they, they, hold a, they hold a conference and at a certain point the, the British leave and uh, the, the Burgundians, the, and France unifies. There's, there's, there's a faction fights between, between regions of France. They unify and then there's a series of decisive battles against the British that, that uh, create a, a powerful, the beginnings of a powerful French nation. Now, at this period, uh, in, in this period, what happens is Cusa uh, travels to Constantinople in uh, 1437, and um, he, he knows Greek, and he, he is over there to try to, the, the idea is, they're, they're basically, they've left the Council of Basel. The Council of Basel is, is organized um, to say that, that the, the consulars have power over the Pope. And at first, Cusa is, is there in opposition to the Pope, uh, Pope Eugene IV. But what he realizes is that this is, this is basically, it, it's, it's chaos. What's going on in the Council of Basel is total chaos. And they don't really want to, they, they don't want to reform from inside. They want to break the power of this Pope. And, and, and also because this Pope is, is actually a decent person uh, who, who is, a, who's, you know, um, a humanist. That Cusa organizes a um, basically moving a whole a minority faction out of the, the Council of Basel, and they uh, they they go down to Ferrara, uh, and then later to Florence. But in the meantime, Cusa goes over to uh, Constantinople, and he gets as many Greek documents as he can to prove that the conflict between the Eastern and the Western Church around the question of the filioque which is the idea that, that the spirit proceeds through the son as well as through the father, um, which is an important concept in terms of human, human dignity. Uh, it, it is, it's that, that the, well, Constantine, I'll get into it, Constantine is the first Roman emperor who supposedly uh, converts to Christianity. And, but the, the, um, the irony of it is that that, that Constantine himself, um, he is, he's, he's a pagan nonetheless. I mean, what he, what he says is there's, first of all, um, he has sacrifices still to gods like Apollo, Diana, Hercules um, in, in various ceremonies, even after his supposed conversion to Christianity. And then in 321, he instructs Christians and non-Christians alike to unite on observing the venerable day of the sun. And he shows up in an, uh, uh, an Apollonian sun raid, uh, you know, uh, toga. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so then, and what you have is this Arius of Alexandria. What Arius, Arius developed something called the Arian heresy, which is the idea, it's a direct attack on the Nicene creed of the Filioque. It says basically there's God up there and there's the sun 
But the Son is different from God. The Son is not God. The Son was created by God, but is not God. And therefore, you, you, therefore you, humanity is removed from God. Because we're, we are, we, I mean, Christ is both man and God. And that's, that's this incredible mystery. And again, if, if you're not Christian, don't, don't, don't worry about, you know, am I saying convert? I'm not. I'm, what I'm saying is, this is a beautiful idea. And it is an efficient idea of mankind, which is, uh, which is critical in terms of the development of, of civilization. Um, Arya says uh, that, that there is a division. So you have a couple of key, um, three key people uh, that develop this idea. Um, of the Trinity. And he basically, um, you know, Basil the Great, John uh, Chrysotom, and Gregory the Theologian, and he studies their works and he brings them back to the council. So what you have is he comes back from Constantinople. And what this proves is that this, this division between Eastern and, the Eastern and Western Church is not, it's, it's not necessary at all. Um, so, what you have here is the, the, this uh, painting, the Journey of the Magi, and what it, it, it's used as an image later on. It's, it's, it's done in the, in the 1450s, but it's an image of the Council of Florence, people coming from all over to this council. And um, they, it, at first it's moved to Ferrara, but then plague breaks out, and so they, so they move to Florence, which is not so bad. Because what happened is, the, the, the dome had been finished by Brunelleschi. And this is the famous um, Santa Maria del Fiore chapel. We have this dome. And um, the, the, other, the other church, Santa Maria Novella, uh, many, many discussions took place in this church in Florence as well. Uh, this, is, is, this is later completed um, by, by Alberti, this facade. But on the inside, you have this, again, incredibly beautiful church. And a painting by Masaccio, who had done the paintings of Peter, of the Trinity. And you have the Holy Spirit, God the Father, the Holy Spirit, and, uh, and Christ. And so just imagine you're walking in and you're looking here at the skeleton. And it says, I once was where you are, and what I am you also will be. And then, as you walk in and you look up, you see people from, from the town, um, Mary Magdalene, uh, Joseph, I believe, I forget exactly, but, and, then, and then Christ. But you see this, you know, you're, you're lifted upwards to this con higher conception of man. Um, this is a... Uh, Guillermo Dufay uh, wrote a um, wrote, wrote this piece of music in celebration of the completion of the dome, and you can hear that it's it's it has many many voices. Prior to that, prior to that, you had mainly Gregorian chant, which was just one voice, but all of a sudden uh, you had you had this incredible development of, of counterpoint and different voices together. There's Brunelleschi looking up at his, at his dome. And you can see how, how incredibly big it is. And these are people. So this is, this is an incredible undertaking. And you can see why Lynn says this was such an important breakthrough. In, in, in architecture and for, for civilization because of the geometry involved in, in the creation of this dome. Um, this is just a painting of the men working with the bricks. And what you see is you have this um, herringbone uh, uh, putting together of the bricks in the dome. And you have, you have an inside dome, you have an outside dome, and you have these staircases 
in between. And you can walk, you know, as you see the people at the top, you can walk all the way up to the top. But what you see here is um, soap bubbles in a frame. And you see the curvature. And what you have is, what, what Brunelleschi did was he, he built this dome without any um, <coughs> lattice going across. He, he built it, what they would do is they would have um, weights on the bricks, pulling them, pulling them in, sort of pulling them in as they were putting the bricks up, but they had no lattice. And it was all based on this geometric conception of, of uh, negative curvature. Um, so it was very, very advanced geometric development at the time. And, you know, sort of think just how a great work of art, but something that's really, <coughs> that made a breakthrough in art that, that is going to make people sort of say, Oh my God! How did you? How did you do this? How did you? How did you know how to do this? You know, what principles of the universe did you have to understand to be able to do this? <clears throat> now, the beauty of the way he did these, the dome, is that you have the dome on the outside, and you have the dome on the inside, and the dome on the inside is all of these incredible frescoes. So. Under the dome, east and west uh, agree. You have uh, Cardinal Vesarion and Cardinal Cesarini, and they agree upon the idea of the filioque. They say, yes, we agree that the, the Holy Spirit proceeds through both the Father and the Son. Um, so this, um, this unites the, the church, very briefly, 1439, by the time the, the, the Greeks get back, there's a total freak out uh, in, in the Eastern Church against this agreement. But, um, but this, is a, this is an agreement which, and Lynn, Lynn says, you know, in, in a couple papers back, he says, even if you establish something that then is destroyed, nonetheless, it doesn't take away the importance of what's established in, in, what, in what, you, what you create. Now this gentleman here, Plethon, he's a, um, a Platonist, and I think he's about 80 when he's there. And I think it's important because you had, you, you, know, you had different, the, the Greeks also wanted, you had Platonists in Greece who wanted to establish this, right? It wasn't, you had Cusa, who was obviously the critical um, organizer of this in a certain way, it was his understanding of the importance of this, but you also had uh, Greek Platonists and he had brought many, many uh, writings to Florence as well and gave classes all throughout this period of the Council of Florence, gave classes on Greek, Greek classics, classes on Plato. And also you'll see later he brought some important maps. This is on the inside of the Santa Maria del Fiore. You have uh, Dante. Uh, there were, class, there were lectures on, on Dante in the church as well at, at, during this whole time. So this is Tommaso Perantucelli, who becomes uh, the Pope. Um, and he says, the Holy Spirit uh, has made itself heard not in Basel, but in Florence. Now, around this time, Cusa writes a very important document called On Learned Ignorance and also on Conjectures, right in the same period. And uh, he dedicates both of these writings to, uh, 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 to the Cardinal, um, sorry, Cesarini, Julius Cesarini. Um, he, and, and in Unlearned Ignorance, he says, the measure with which man strives for the inquiry of truth has no rational proportion to truth itself. And consequently, the person who is contented this side of precision does not perceive the error. And therein do men differentiate themselves. These boast to have advanced to the complete precision whose unattainability the wise recognize so that those are the wiser who know of their ignorance. 
And this is the idea of, of learned ignorance. Um, whatever is not truth cannot measure truth precisely. By comparison, a non-circle cannot measure a circle whose being is something indivisible. Hence, the intellect, which is not truth, never comprehends truth so precisely that truth cannot be comprehended infinitely more precisely. For the intellect is to truth as an inscribed polygon is to the inscribing circle. The more angles the inscribed polygon has, the more similar it is to the circle. However, even if the number of angles are increased ad infinitum, the polygon never becomes equal to the circle unless it is resolved into an identity with the circle. And he uses these examples. So the truth is the circle, and intellect is the inscribed polygon. And you can make as many sides as, as, you, as you want. Even if you created sides that were that small, it still would not be a circle. That there's something intrinsically different about the circle than the polygon. Hence, there is nothing in the universe which does not enjoy a certain singularity that cannot be found in any other thing. So that no thing excels all others in all respects or excels, excels different things in equal measure. By comparison, there can never in any respect be something equal to another. Even if at one time one thing is less than another and at another time is greater than this other, it makes this transition with a singular, a certain singularity so that it never attains precise equality with the other. Similarly, a square inscribed in a circle passes with respect to its size from being a square which is smaller than the circle to being a square larger than the circle without ever arriving at its equal. And an angle of incidence increases from being lesser than a right angle to being greater than a right angle without the medium of equality. So that's, that's really something. He's saying you can, you can expand a square and it may pass through that of, of the, 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 the equality of the circle, but it's, it, at no point will it be the same as the circle. So we'll see what he's, what he's getting at later when he writes, 10 years later, he writes the, writes the quadrature of the circle. And he says, but the maximum intellect, since it is the limit of the potentiality of every intellectual nature and exists in complete actuality, cannot at all exist without being intellect in such a way that it is also God who is all in all. By will of illustration, assume that a polygon inscribed in a circle were then human nature, and the circle were the divine nature. Then if the polygon were to be a maximum polygon, then which, that which there can be no greater polygon, it would not exist, it would exist, sorry, not through itself with finite angles, but in the circular shape. Thus it would not have its own shape for existing, i.e. it would not have a shape which was, even conceivably separable from the circle and eternal shape. So he's developing a series of paradoxes and um, paradoxes that will force the human mind to, to think in a different way. Lin says that Kuza is the founder of modern science. What is it about Kuza that, that, that makes that true? Now that's that's the question that we're that we're going to get at here. Um, so he writes he writes uh, this in on learned ignorance. Then um, he writes on conjectures. And again, this is uh, dedicated to uh, to Julian. And he says. He again echoes that the precision of truth is unattainable. It, since that's true, every human positive assertion of the truth is a conjecture, or in a sense, a hypothesis. 
Therefore, the unity of the unattainable truth is known through conjectural otherness, and the conjecture of otherness is known in the, simplicity, in the simplest unity of truth. So, the, the truth is unity, is, is one. That's, that's what he develops as the conception of, of God. And what he's trying to do is to get human beings to imagine something which is really, in a sense, unimaginable to us because you can't, you can't think of one. In fact, you, will, you know, in, in, in the, in the idea of the Trinity, interestingly, metaphorically, is that you can never think of, of one because you have, um, he develops different ideas of, of how mankind thinks about God uh, in, a, in a Trinitarian way. Um, he says, conjectures must go forth from our minds as the real world does from infinite divine reason. For since the human mind, the lofty similitude of God, participates, as far as it can, in the fecundity of the creatrix nature, it exerts, it, it exerts the rational form itself as the image of omnipotent form in the similitude of real en entities. The human mind is therefore the form of the conjectural world, as the divine is that of the real. Therefore, just as that absolute divine entity is all that which is in everything which is, so also the unity of the human mind is the entity of its conjectures. The mind's eye is infinite rationality. Only in the infinite rationality will the mind intuit itself as it is, since infinite rationality alone is the measure for all rational things. The closer we are elevated to assimilation with it, the more deeply we penetrate into our mind, whose unique vital center it is. For this reason, we aspire with natural desire for perfecting knowledge. Therefore, from the power of its enfolding unity, the mind as triune origin first unfolds multitude. The multitude then engenders inequality and magnitude. For this reason, our mind hunts in the primordial multitude for the magnitudes or perfections which are varied and unequal, as uh, integrated in the prime exemplar. Then it proceeds from both to composition. Therefore, our mind is the distinctive, proportionate, and, comp and compositive origin. So he, he goes on in this, on conjectures, to discuss the prime unity of, of God, the Creator. And then he says there's intellect, which is one step removed. And then you have rationality, which is one step removed from that. And then you have things. You have the, the material world. So what he describes is this process of higher and higher powers um, of, of, of understanding and of, and of cognition. Uh, so um, the, um, he says, since the, div the divine mind is the most absolute precision of all, it happens that every created mind participates in it differently in the otherness of variation, while that ineffable mind itself endures as imparticipable, imparticipable. And the condition of those participating in it brings this about. Therefore, all our intelligence exists out of participation in the divine actuality, in the variety of potentiality. To be able to understand the truth as it is in uh, as it is in actuality, befits created minds, just as it is particular to our God to be that actuality, which is participated in variedly in created minds in potentiality. The more deiform, therefore, an intelligence is, the closer its potentiality is to the actuality as it is. However, the more obscure, the more distant. So the the closer you are to, to things, 
the less close you are to this divine idea, this, this, to, to God, to, to, to unity. Um, so it's interesting because it's also, you know, you think about um, um, the development of this idea later. Um, I'm, I can't remember the name of the Russian scientist, Vernadsky, right? This idea of, the, of things, of animals, of, 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 uh, of humanity, and the creator. So it's a very developed idea in this period. Um, so he, he takes you through this incredible, incredible journey. Um, but then at the end, he basically, he says that, um, he says, however you see, Father Julian, however you are a similitude, how, how you are a similitude of God. The humanity contracted in you is indeed triune, for it is unity or entity contracted individually in which equality and connection exist. Through the entity of humanity you are a man, and indeed such that in this entity the equality of entity, justice or order, and connection or love exist. For everything that is in you is ordered most justly in this unity according to the equality of unity. And he says, what this, the, the equality of unity is love. That, that, that what God, that, 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 that's what is unity, is love. So it's a very, very beautiful idea. Um, so I'm going to keep going here. <clears throat> now, um, um, this uh, pope makes Cusa a cardinal, Nicholas V, his old friend. Um, at the same time, what you have, this has, there's, there's pract immediately practical implications to all, all of this development of the Concordancia Catolica. Um, the, 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 the creation of the powerful nation state of France um, begins to take birth in Louis XI, who is uh, sent to Dauphine, Dauphine, I guess it's, I, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, but it's a state. Um, Charles VII is, is not particularly a humanist, um, but he, his son, Louis XI, goes to uh, the state of Dauphiné and develops, he, he starts major internal improvements. So even though he's not king of France yet, um, he's eager to get, get started in this conception of nation building. So he comes directly out of this uh, th this Florentine Renaissance idea. Um, so what he does is uh, he, he begins experiments in economic reform here, um, capitalizing on the initiative of entrepreneurs and inventors whom he protected absolutely in agriculture, industry, and commerce. He adopted protectionist and anti-dumping measures to protect grain growers and linen producers exempted traders from provincial tariffs while imposing tariffs on foreign merchandise, and encouraged skilled laborers from other countries to come in to Dauphiné and settle there with their families, guaranteeing them tax exemptions which were proportional to their productivity. So this is the beginning of a nation state, right in this period. This is really the first, this is far advanced from the other, uh, the other beginnings of nation states that we had looked at in the 1200s. Um, the local government had petitioned Louis to expel the Jews, uh, complaining that they were ruining the country through usury. This was a common accusation made against the Jews at the time. Louis and his council refused the petition and the Jews were allowed to live wherever they wished in the Dauphine. Um, so you have, again, this um, ecumenical society of Christians, Jews, um, and, and, and Muslims as well, still in southern Spain, just to the, just to the south. Now, in 1450, Cusa writes the, the quadrature of the circle. And um, here he develops further the idea that he had laid out earlier. Um, 
Archimedes of Syracuse was uh, a, a Greek philosopher who had basically attempted to square the circle by increasing the, the polygons inside and the polygons outside uh, to, to, to infinity. Um, but what Kuzit what Kuzit develops is this idea that you have this um, particular horn-like angle, and he says that there is, a, there is an infinitesimal in there, which which ex exists, but it's infinitesimal. And what he what he develops is the idea that this is a um, it, it's a certain singularity. And it is, um, it's this question of powers again that he looks at. The, the question of powers of what generates, what's the generative process of it, that these are different, uh, these are different species. A circle is a completely different species than the line. That the circle is derived from, from a sphere, cutting the sphere, that the line is derived from the folding of the circle, but they're completely, that one is derived from the other. And there is a completely different power. Um, so what he shows is that you, there is no other line that you can create from that point that, uh, that will not cross through that circle. He says, now you have an infinity of curves at that point. You can have an infinity of, of curves going, going out from that point. But you, can, you can't have, you can only have one line. Um, so he, he develops the idea of, of pi, that um, you have this, it's not just uh, an, an irrational, it's not an irrational number. I mean, the Greeks knew irrational numbers. They knew the square root of two, the square roots of, but th this was a completely different number. It was a number of a higher species. and. That, that this is the essence of his scientific method, that he, he develops the idea there's a number here which is of a completely different species. So if you, if you think about this idea of the, the polygon or the square um, crossing through a certain point, it never actually reaches that number. It can't. It's a different order of number. So, um, so that's absolutely a critical breakthrough in, in, in science because what he's what he's developing is the different different you know the power of, of geometry the power of um, of different processes of geometry now um, Aeneas Silvius Piccolomini writes an education for Ladislas the king of Bohemia around the same the same time and what you see is, um, you know, this is, he will become the Pope later, Pope Pius II, another friend of, of Cusa's. And just to give you a sense of it, I mean, he, he talks about um, how you train a young person, how you, how you educate a young person, not, not train, but how you, he says training, but how you educate a young person. Um, he says, in Augustus Caesar and Socrates, we have instances of entire, in, entire indifference in choice of food. Caligula, Nero, Vitellius serve as examples of grossly sensuous tastes. We now hasten on to the larger and more important division of our subject, that which treats the most precious of all human endowments, the mind. Birth, wealth, fame, health, vigor, and beauty are indeed highly prized by mankind, but they are, all, they are one and all of the nature of accidents. They come and they go. But the riches of the mind are a stable possession, unassailable by fortune, calumny, or time. How can I adjudge, uh, he, he, he talks about Socrates in the Gorgias Dialogue saying, how can I adjudge the great king happy until I know to what he can truly lay claim in character and in wisdom. So you see the direct in effect of the Platonic dialogues um, as this, uh, this, this humanist who becomes Pope 
in terms of trying to educate this young prince who happens to be the young, young prince who will become the king of Bohemia and Hungary. And unfortunately, he, he, he only lives to be 17, so we don't really find out what, uh, what the effects of this educational process was. But, uh, you know, it goes, it goes on from there. Uh, it's it's, this, it's a, a short document, but it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, now, the next pope in between, Calixtus III, uh, he, he tells Henry the Navigator uh, to prove devotion to God by making the seas navigable. Henry the Navigator is um, a prince from Portugal who the Florent Florentines have been organizing and recruiting over the prior 30 years. Um, uh, Pope Pius II, uh, this is, you know, Silvio Piccolomini, he becomes the next pope. Uh, and then you have, in 1461, the uh, Louis XI becomes the king of France. So he's now, Charles VII dies, uh, Louis XI now becomes the, the king of France, and he takes what he did in this small state and expands it throughout the entire nation of, of France. Um, and what he does is um, he brings in all, he, he creates universities throughout France. Uh, and he brings in science and astronomy, particularly, uh, as well as you know, in, increased production of food, in, with an emphasis on the increase of, of population, an increase of the development of the population. Unfortunately, his son, Charles VIII, uh, is, is an idiot. And even though, um, even though his father had written him an entire uh, book called The Rose Bush of War, where he, he lays out to him the, the, the basis for being a king, um, Charles, is, Charles, VIII, Charles VIII basically rejects the whole, the whole idea um, what, what Louis XI says in this, uh, in, in this book, The Rosebush of War, <clears throat> just to give you a, a sense of it, because it's an important, it's an important document. It's, it's written in 1483, 1482-83, right before he dies. And you see the embodiment of, Cusa, Cusa has now, Cusa is dead, but you see the embodiment of Cusa in this king. And he says, considering that the characteristic of kings and princes and their knights is that their estate and vocation is to defend the common good, both ecclesiastic and secular, and to uphold justice and peace among their subjects and to do good, they will have good in this world and in the other, and out of doing evil will only come grief. And one must count one day on leaving this world to go and give an account of one's undertakings and receives run, one's reward, and to expose their lives for others, of which among all other estates of the world is most to be praised and honored. And because the common good, which concerns many, which is the public matter of the realm, is more praiseworthy than the particular, by which the common good is often frustrated, we have gladly put in writing the deeds of princes and of their knights and of all the good tenants that serve their cause. I have seen nothing which has more destroyed and annihilated the power of the Romans than the fact that they listened more to their individual interest than to the common good. When justice reigns in a kingdom, the common good is well guarded, and so is the particular. Because justice is such a virtue that maintains human company and common life, providing that everyone makes a wise use of common things as common and of particular things as particular. Um, uh, 
you know, again, throughout the whole, throughout the whole thing, we must not love this world except in doing good, because life in this world is brief and affliction endless, which shall be brought upon those who have not lived rightly. You know, the, the, the duties of kings and princes on justice, it's a whole, uh, whole discussion with his son. And uh, what his son, now, I mean, this is a result of a, of a cooperation between Florence and, 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 and France. Uh, this is a product of that. So he, he basically organizes war against, against uh, various you know, states of Italy and then dies. Uh, he's playing a game. I think mean, he falls off of his horse and, and dies. So this is the problem that you, that you have. This is the problem that they're dealing with. How do you, if you have a Louis XI, then you have a, you have a chance. In, in, to create a nation state where, where humanity is, is, is going to be uplifted. If you don't, then you have no basis for, there's no security that that nation state is going to continue like, like a republic. Right? It, it's, it's still up to the whim of a particular king. And you have this idea of the, the prince's mirror, which is philosophers trying to educate kings and princes uh, in, in philosophy. But, uh, you know, if you get an idiot, then the population suffers incredibly. So Cusa dies in, in 1464, and his doctor, uh, and the scientist Paolo Toscanelli is his executor. Um, Pope, Pope Pius dies three days later. Um, so 64 is the, you know, the, the death of the lives of, of two critical people, uh, the end of the lives of two critical people in this, in this process. Now, uh, Pleton, this uh, philosopher, the Greek philosopher would come over and, and give given classes on, uh, on Plato and et cetera. He, he brought over a map from um, Strabo, who's a Greek, uh, Greek historian from right around the time of the birth of Christ. Um, and what you see here, first of all, you see this, in this uh, illustration, it's clear that he's holding a, a globe, right? So he's, not, he's not holding a flat earth, he's holding a globe. So this idea of a, of a flat earth, you know, the Greeks knew from, from, from early on that there was curvature to the earth. Um, and uh, so, but this is this is a map that he produces. And you see, here's Europe. And you see that you can sail to Asia. Now, the reason this was critical was because this is a copy of a map from 1467 of Ptolemy, the great scientific hoaxer. And what he did is he put this terra incognito on the bottom of the the map, which we're at the bottom of Africa, right? But what you see is it goes all the way around. So what's be, what's below there? Who knows, right? Scary monsters. And so you know, this is this is uh, Ptolemy's you know Ptolemy's admonition: don't go there. So so it's it's very it's very critical that this map uh, is, is is brought in by. Uh, by, by Pleton, because what it shows is that you can you can get around there. Now, now Toscanelli, um, Cusa's old friend, he writes to Christopher Columbus. Um, and he, Christopher Columbus is, um, he's an admiral. Um, he is, uh, is part of these circles. And this is the map that, um, that Toscanelli gives, gives him. He says to Christopher Columbus, this is later, this is reproduced by Columbus. To Christopher Columbus, uh, Paolo, physician, greetings. I see this magnificent and grand desire of yours to see 
how to get to the regions where spices are born. And in reply to your letter, I send you a copy of another letter, which I wrote some time ago to a friend and familiar with the most serene king of Portugal before the Castilian War. In reply to another letter, which by commission of his highness was written to me about the said matter. And I send you another such map of sailing as the one I wrote to him, through which your questions will be satisfied. So what his map says is, you can get there by going west. Right? So not only can you get there by going east, as the map of Strabo shows, but you can get there by going west as well. Now, uh, this, is, this is interesting because it shows you the, the key aspect of Portugal is Henry the Navigator set up a um, uh, school of Sagres. And this little point right here, you can barely see it, this little point here, that's that point. And there's a fort. And you can see the fort here, and you have this town and this harbor. Um, and you have, a, you have a, a compass in the fort. So you see this, you know, he's, he's very focused on navigation and uh, going, going, uh, going west. And the School of Sagres produces these, these ships that um, Columbus will later use in, in getting across to America. Now, the uh, two of the key mathematicians and uh, uh, scientists, you have this Junto, of, junto de Matemáticos, uh, this group of mathematicians, this Junto, and you have Jose uh, Vizinho and Abraham Zacuto. And this is a... Uh, uh, at the name of the uh, astrolab. And it's actually, you can't see it, but it has Arabic writing on it. And so what, what you have here is, uh, you know, the, 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 the um, culmination of Jewish, Islamic, and, and Christian science all coming together to go west. Um, so th this, is, this is really critical because this is the view of man, of, of the, the humanist view of man, right? Now, Columbus goes to uh, Queen Isabella and Ferdinand and they give him the, they, they give him the commission to, to go. Now, obviously, you know, what, what they're interested in is getting new land, conquering new people. Uh, they, they represent this Aristotelian Habsburg view of man. Uh, spices, etc. This whole discussion of spices, you know, it's not clear at all that, that, that Toscanelli didn't know that there was America in between, that there was some, uh, there's no reason to think that he, that he thought it was necessary. That, that you get to China first, that you wouldn't find some other territory. But how are you going to sell that to Isabella and Ferdinand, right? The, because they, all they want is, so you're trying to get out of Europe so you can establish government, the government that, um, the government that exists in Concordancia Catholica, but can only exist tenuously in Europe. So you have to go west. So he goes, but here's the irony. He said, in the same, this is from Columbus, <clears throat> in the same month in which their majesties Ferdinand and Isabella issued the edict that all Jews should be driven out of the kingdom and its territories, in the same month they gave me the order to undertake with sufficient men my expedition of discovery to the Indies. So, that's the end of, of science right there. I mean, he, the, it's the, the oligarchical principle in Europe. But we get, we get across. <clears throat> this is the Tuscanelli map. Um, and you can see where, where America is in between. So before he gets there, he, he hits here. <clears throat> but uh, 
That's the landing of Columbus in 1492. Uh, the reason they didn't know about North, North America, their map is actually smaller than the actual size of the Earth. Right. And they didn't have access to the story of Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes. Uh, in uh, in uh, Egypt. Yeah. Where he figured the actual, uh, with the actual size of the Earth. Yeah. His equation was close to the Earth. It was, yeah. I don't know that they didn't know. Um, there's an article which it is 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 in depth, and I didn't I didn't do the work on studying it to the extent that I that I should have, um, which argues that Columbus did actually know. Um, so maybe they did have access to Aristosthenes. I don't know. I mean, they had a lot of Greek writings that were that were brought in there. But, but, yeah, but anyway, they, it's, they didn't have they didn't have the ancient Greek right, with that particular measure at that time. Maybe they yeah. found out right later. Uh, that's why it was that. But they no no sail of that period would think the Earth to be flat. Right. Because uh, they all they all. Spiritual. Sure. Spiritual. Uh, common observation. Sure. You know, they, because they, when they went from one place Disappear to another, <laughs> they had to, they knew that as they got towards the place, they could see more of whatever they were trying to see. So therefore, it had to be on a curve. So what, so what this established, even, even though this, as Lynn goes through, you know, th this did not create the, the American Republic. Uh, but this got us there. And, um, and it, would take, it would take time, obviously, in Europe. And, and you have the whole, uh, what comes out of this in 1620 and, and the, uh, the founding of the, of the Massachusetts Bay Colony and the American Republic. That would come after another 150 years of religious warfare, the 30 years war, et cetera. Um, but that this, this, was, this laid the basis for the creation of the United States Republic, where Cousa's ideas could actually uh, develop and come to fruition. So that's a whole other class. Yeah. So that's that's what I have.